This podcast is presented by the Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Hi, I'm Hannah Storm. I'm Heather. I'm Kelsey. And this is our podcast, These Books Made Me. Today, we're going to be continuing our American Girl series of episodes with Molly and her original six books. Friendly warning, as always, this podcast contains spoilers. If you don't yet know whose underwear falls from the sky onto Dolores and Jill, proceed with caution. Was this everyone's first time reading? If not, how did this reread compare to your memories of reading it when you were younger? Um, This was not my first time reading it, but it's been quite a while since I first read it. I first read it in 1998 when I was eight years old. So um, that was Molly was my first American Girl doll and book that um, I got as a present for Christmas. Also not my first time reading it. I read it also when I was probably about eight and I was really into American Girls when I was little. So I read all of the books back then. Uh, Reading it now, I had forgotten a lot of stuff. I think I remembered that Molly's dad was at war, but there wasn't a lot of detail that I retained. So this was almost like reading fresh. Again, continuing the theme, I have no idea if I've read these before or not. (laughs) I, I thought I had, but like most of the details are gone. The only thing I always think of with Molly is Victory Gardens and rationing. Like... I think I read some of her books. I don't remember which ones. Um, so yeah, it was it was interesting because I was kind of reading these <laughs> with fresh eyes. I read the Molly books. I don't know how old I was exactly, but it was whatever age I was at when I had uh, Felicity and was into American Girl dolls. I think I read all of the books that were out at the time, whether or not I had the dolls or not. And I think Molly was you know, possibly my favorite uh, story-wise and doll-wise. Okay, so we're going to get a little background information today about the chronology of American Girls. The chronology of the American Girl books has piqued our interest as we make our way through the first six historical girls. Each set of books starts in a year ending in four. So, for example, Molly's books begin in 1944 and generally follow a sequence of seasons covering approximately a year and a half. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to locate an explanation for the four obsession, so that will remain a mystery. Working theories include superstition about four being a lucky number and that the idea for the dolls came to Pleasant Roland during a trip to Williamsburg in 1984, but there's nothing definitive. So instead, I explored the broader issue of chronology in the American Girl books. Pleasant Roland started the company with the goal of having coverage of specific time periods she found important as a teacher and textbook writer. The decision about when to center the original three girls in history seems to have been born from a mix of personal interest and pure capitalism. The authors of the American Girl series of books were primarily educators and writers of fiction selected personally by Pleasant Roland. Roland reportedly maintained tight control of the production of the books, and the authors were given specific direction on everything from historical points to cover to tone. Roland tasked the authors with creating books that celebrated, quote, family, hard work, honesty, courage, reliability, and responsibility, while also sticking to the formulaic six-book cycle that would coordinate with specific outfits and accessories. For example, each doll had a learns a lesson story that corresponded with a lunchbox and foods, a desk, an outfit, and school accessories. The chosen accessories, which were researched and developed with a high level of detail, would then be interwoven into the story by the author. The historical period informed the character of each doll as well. As Valerie Tripp, author of the Molly books, says, quote, her personal journey mirrors or is a metaphor for what was going on in history at that time. All right, let's dive right into the books. Meet Molly. From being a prisoner to vegetables to planning out in detail the perfect Halloween, follow Molly and her friends as their spooky night turns into an all-out war. Will this Halloween be more tricks than treats? This book, you guys, they're so mean. These (laughs) These were intense. So just a, a quick rundown of the prank war. Ricky, who is Molly's older brother, annoys her. Ricky has a crush on Jill, the sister's best friend, Dolores. They end up like mocking Ricky in front of Dolores. So he conspires to dump water all over them and all of them get in trouble. But it's not over because then the girls like escalate even further and get all of his underwear 
trick Dolores into coming outside of the house and then dump Ricky's underwear on her head. That seems worse for Dolores than for Ricky. Mm-hmm. TBH. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, it, it seemed like the escalation of the prank war was really intense. But then at the end, it was just kind of like, eh, yeah, we took it too far. We're all good now. Like, there was no yeah, real, like... there was no resolution, really. No. It felt really <laughs> weird that the mom was just like, you know, pick up and do the laundry. And, and like, and instantly, Molly and Ricky are friend, like, you know, friendly again. That would never happen for a sibling relationship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was like a serious escalation. But I think also like part of it was that they didn't like that Ricky's punishment when he watered them down was like, oh, you just lose your Halloween candy. Like they felt like that wasn't dramatic enough. But I don't know. I think that's pretty terrible. Like you spend all night collecting your Halloween treats and then you get none of them. Oh, wait, no, he got to keep he got some. One. He got one. Piece. <laughs> but here's the thing. And this really confused me when I when I was reading the, the trick or treating scene is like, trick-or-treating was really weird when you didn't have like pre-wrapped candy <laughs> like you it just was. bring yeah. a bag and you get like a fresh donut just thrown into your bag <laughs> and then like come sit in our house and drink a cup of cider right now like i just <laughs> where did so the cups go so that was they give them two cups of cider they like chugging them on the doorstep mm-hmm. so do you take <laughs> the cups home and then like rinse them out and like take them back to the neighbor the next day <laughs> well i actually looked up a bit about how Halloween back then and surprisingly sometimes for some uh neighborhoods and stuff they would do Halloween three nights three consecutive nights they would go about doing trick-or-treating so uh and more oftentimes um adults would invite the kids in especially during wartime to chit chat with the children because of their sons and daughters are overseas in war Mm. a very different world yeah I was thinking at least with the cider like when I was a kid, my mom was really concerned about razor blades and candy. <laughs> I don't know if that ever actually happened. It's the kind of thing that happened one time and in, and like traumatized now has every become, parent in America. Yeah. <laughs> or like now there's there's always a thing of like drugs in the candy. Mm. Like you, there's someone's going to sneak drugs in the candy. And it's like someone's probably not going to waste their drugs just to like put it in candy. Drugs are like, too expensive for that. <laughs> Yeah, my parents would always have to inspect each wrapper to make sure it was still sealed. Wrapped candy didn't come about until the 1960s, 70s is when they started to prepackage candy for trick-or-treating. But yeah, it was donuts and apples and like nuts and coins that they would hand out to the kids. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I guess they were, they didn't really talk about it a lot, but they were in a period of sugar rationing. So mm-hmm. I would assume even if there had been pre-wrapped candy, it wouldn't have been available in the yeah. in but they did get way. candy at allison's house because she gave out tootsie roll pops right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah her family's wealthy so they, i guess they had the money i guess the rations didn't apply <laughs> yeah. to them they like black market tootsie roll pop <laughs> splurged yeah that was strange um i don't understand the whole relationship with allison either so valerie tripp made a choice to make molly kind of unlikable mm. at times and I think that's accurate, though. Like, it's hard as an adult because you kind of look at it and you're like, oh, no, Molly, what are you doing? That's (laughs) awful. Why? Why do you have no empathy for others? But kids are really solipsistic. So I feel like probably that it didn't register to me that like, oh, Molly's not very nice to Alice and Molly's not as a kid means the book was successful. That's the way kids can be is like you have something different about you. Like it, it, the thing with Allison is always like her mom is kind of out of touch or like does some uh, socially inept things and that reflects poorly on Allison. And then they kind of latch onto that as a way to other her because that's what kids do is they like latch on to differences. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think, I think Molly does at some points realize like I'm being unfair to Allison right now and does have that growth especially late in later books where she realizes like, okay, this was a me thing and I need to like move past it. By the end, she more or less writes the ship. So I, you know, I think we've sort of struggled with what were the big take homes in some of the books. And Samantha ones seemed very focused on clear social issues. Like this book is meant to tell you how bad child labor was. This book is you know, meant to tell you about suffrage. These were a little bit more obscure to me in terms of like, this is the historical point we really want to drive home. They seem to be more like Molly's arc is don't be selfish, you know, like 
think about others more, which I think that's pretty effective. That's relatable. I mean, if you're thinking about what Valerie Tripp said, though, about how that's metaphorical, I mean, the central kind of historical point that they drive home is this idea of rationing and doing things for the greater good of the United States and the war effort and patriotism. And so I imagine that's kind of what Valerie Tripp had in mind is like this idea of thinking outside yourself and what you can do for others as the kind of larger social message going on at the time. Um, one thing I wanted to just quickly on the Halloween topic too, I'm going to be kind of weaving in our, how did it hold up question throughout these books this time. Um, and so this time I wanted to jump on the, uh, talk about the hula costumes. Um, so Molly and her friends decide to dress up as hula dancers and our intrepid researcher, Ella did some background research for us on hula and the appropriation of hula. Um, and so there's a lot of history there and I would, uh, we'll share some links in our episode notes, but just to note that, um, there is a movement to say that, you know, hula is not a costume, it's a culture. You should not wear it as a costume. This is kind of an ongoing theme with the books that we've been reading of inappropriate Halloween costumes. Um, and hula in particular has a long history of being, um, overly sexualized and, um, just, inappropriately uh, adapted. It was interesting because on the newer covers of the Meet Molly book, she's actually in her hula costume, which is kind of weird because it moves away from the commercialization of like the selling the outfit. I don't know if she had a hula outfit. She did. She did. did she? Oh, yeah. she did. Yeah. She had the little skirt and everything. Mm -hmm. Eesh. So yeah, not great. But yeah, Halloween is definitely one of those topics where you can see the evolution of understanding that certain things are not okay. But I think it's also interesting to look at, well, we realized this particular thing wasn't okay a lot earlier than we recognized that this thing wasn't okay. And so like something like Hula, you mentioning that that's on the cover of the later editions of this book, that's a choice. I cannot imagine that we would have put, uh, you know, somebody dressed up as Pocahontas for Halloween mm. or something like that on the cover of one of these books had it <laughs> occurred in the book. I think they would have tried to get away from that. Right. I think today people are still not really talking about hula or thinking about the cultural implications of it and thinking about it as something that should not, like as an appropriative thing i don't i i think that that's still something few folks are becoming aware of um, i agree they they should have just gone with the three musketeers for their costumes <laughs> yeah that would have been better <laughs> anyway <laughs> very much so or cinderella and the two ugly stepsisters although come on molly like no one wants to be the stepsisters <laughs> <laughs> i like it's how she, she was really into the idea until she realized like oh I don't have the Cinderella dress. <laughs> <laughs> because her mom would have to make it. Yeah. Well, even her Cinderella dress was odd sounding. You know, she wanted this big floaty skirt, but that she was going to wear an Angora like sweater with it, <laughs> <laughs> which is not how I envision Cinderella <laughs> ever. But, you know, that's cool. I don't think, yeah, I don't think Cinderella wore a lot of, you know, sweaters generally. I don't think that was She's the really aesthetic. Into knitwear. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to comment a little bit on the food in the books. We, we spent a lot of time talking about food in the Samantha books because they were very prominent. Um, but in the Valerie Tripp Samantha books, she kind of got away from that. She goes back to food in these a lot more than she did in those. So um, the rationing is really important to these stories. Like I think it's brought up in every single book. And so in this one, we learned that sugar and butter are being rationed. But then Gladys makes French toast for the whole family for breakfast the morning after Molly, like, I guess, finally choked down the turnips that her mom seasoned for her. But you wouldn't make French toast. Like, that would have killed off their rations for like the week. Didn't she say it was like a special recipe or was that something else that had a special like no butter recipe? That was a cake, I think. Was, yeah. For the Couldn't later you book. make... Does French, I'm sorry, does French just have to have sugar? I know it has to have eggs, but does it have to have sugar and butter? 
Like, would there be over French toast use, making it? Yeah, yeah. You, know, oil you, you would need either your butter or your margarine, though, yeah, to, okay. to cook it. And then you need some sweetener. So unless they had like maple syrup syrup. Yeah. Very odd. Yeah. It was a, an interesting choice from Gladys, who before that was like so, so firm on. No, you got to take one for the team and eat the turnips and we're not going to touch the rations. I'm going to make all these breads with mm -hmm. tomato juice and all of these other things so that we don't touch the rations. Maybe she grew the French toast in her garden. <laughs> <Maybe> so, <laughs> Yes, a French toast bush. I love it. The only other thing I noted from these books is the art is unsettling. <laughs> Agree. I, and it's weird because some of the art is like the the other books like it's just you know your traditional like kind of oil painting-esque kind of art which I like and then occasionally there'd be these little like they almost look like clip art clip art yeah and <sighs> the the most uncomfortable one to me is the turnip I, like that I, I I don't need my vegetables to have a face <laughs> <laughs> right the the old edition version it's like turnip emojis for like three pages worth yeah. of them it was crazy i was just looking at it like that's a really bizarre choice because it didn't at all seem in keeping with the general illustration mm -hmm. style yeah it's not for it's like eight it's very 80s <laughs> <laughs> especially since they also still had some of the old art style for the smaller images yeah. like, right like the locket with her father that's kind of with the actual paintings of you know the the characters and then we got the clip art <laughs> Yeah, it's just very odd. And then these illustrations just generally, not to belabor this particular book too much, but this is broadly across all of the Molly books. I felt like the artist for this one was very definitely going for like a Norman Rockwell sort mm. of vibe. Mm -hmm. I don't know how effective they are, though, because I feel like that's really undercut by the weird clip art. Mm -hmm. And then the cover art feels a very different style. So I'm not sure. I, I've really enjoyed the illustrations generally in the other books, and these didn't quite work so well for me. Mm. Um, I guess that's a good lead in for the next book, because uh, speaking of Norman Rockwell, the cover for the Molly Learns a Lesson is kind of Norman Rockwell for her sitting at her desk being attentive. Um, so for Molly Learns a Lesson, Molly learns a hard lesson in being selfish and prideful when her class participates in a competition to see who can, can come up with the best plan to help out soldiers overseas called the Lend a Hand Project. I was just glad that this teacher seemed nice. I feel like the other books, well, I guess Samantha's teacher was nice, but there were the Nellie's teacher was mean and Kirsten's teacher was mean, even though she got a redemption arc. And I was just glad there was like a nice teacher in the world. <laughs> but see, I, I think that we just read them as mean because I felt like Kirsten's teacher was meant to be likable. They made yeah. her like a big character. And I was thinking all of these books, it seems like the authors are primarily educators who then write on the side or write educational um, materials. There's a lot of like teacher deification going on because in, in really all of these, the girls are like, oh, my teacher's so pretty. Oh, my teacher's so great. Oh, she's going to come live with us. Oh, she, you know, there's all this rhapsodizing over how great the teachers are. So I... <laughs> I feel like the authors are kind of seeping in a little bit there to be like, teachers are the best um, yeah. and work those in in kind of funny ways. But yes, this this teacher seemed likable. <laughs> yeah. And but like, that's the interesting thing is I do think Kirsten's teacher is supposed to be like likable, but she wasn't. <laughs> and like I said, Samantha's teacher is OK, but then Nellie's teacher was mean. And it seems actually weird to me that they would like make such rough teachers being teachers that they would write them so uh like having so little empathy for their their students most of the time i mean i think they definitely present this teacher as ultra nice and kind of an idealized person who marley really looks up to but um you know that aside the multiplication multiplication b seemed like an exercise in public humiliation <laughs> like oh we did those when i was a way kid to do math oh really my gosh really yeah seems like a really good way to make any kid who was like iffy about math hate it oh yeah <laughs> i do like that molly's friends are like brutally honest especially linda <laughs> i liked that friendship between the three of them because 
they kind of call her on her nonsense a lot. Mm-hmm. But then they also just call her on stuff for no reason. Like, <laughs> where Linda was like, yeah, you're just really bad at this. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Molly. She's like, I need to move to Mars. <laughs> or, right. Or like later, I know this isn't in this book, but when Linda's literally just like, yeah, you're good at dancing, but your hair is bad. So you can't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Crown's gonna look bad on you, know you're here, so you're not gonna get the solo. <laughs> Molly's just like, like you're right. <laughs> Everyone at camp knows you can't swim, Molly. Yeah. <laughs> but they're very loyal with each other because, like, even when Linda's brutally honest, they still stick with her to carry out her separating from the class to do the raising the um, bottle caps instead of doing the knitting socks thing. <laughs> they do. It's a really nice uh, depiction of the kind of friendships you have when you're a small child, like where it really is more like family almost Mm -hmm. than friends. Like you have almost a sibling type relationship where you can say things like that to your friends. And if it's not coming from a place of malice, like it's okay. It's just, you know, you're just honest with each other. And there's that level of trust there where it's like, I know this wasn't meant to wound. It was just, Mm. that's just the way things are. My hair's bad. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I mean, need a did, friend like that. They had to try to like chip in for a product to fix it. So like that's, you know, that's friendship. Yeah, yeah they were giving up their money to get her her pump kit later. So yeah, Molly's hair struggles are relatable um, as a person with brown sticks for hair and bangs. I, I did, um, mm-hmm. you know, Molly's hair drama throughout the books. Well, Storm, you too. Yeah. I'm sure. With- like, it was like, oh, yeah, man, it is awful when your hair gets wet and you have bangs. <laughs> this is true. So then I looked to see if Valerie Tripp had bangs because I felt like she really understood the struggle bangs. <laughs> but yeah, Molly's hair struggles are very relatable. But it's also a trope, right? There's a lot of things in here and in all of the American Girl books that we've read that are very like heavily relying on like literary tropes Mm. or they're more or less just replicating something that was a very well-known feature of another book. So like Molly's whole hair drama was very Anne of Green Gables Mm. with the like Mm -hmm. buy something from the peddler to dye your hair. (laughs) And I think that's part of why these work. Mm. They're not great literature, right? Like (laughs) nobody's doing anything that's particularly beautiful writing or like Mm. innovative here, but they're doing things that are kind of tried and true that like they know will land. So it kind of goes back to that, like commercialism of everything about American girl. It's not just about the products, but the books are kind of that way too. Uh, When I looked into the schools a bit for this book, I was surprised to learn that uh, for this time period, a lot of times they'd have separate playgrounds for boys and girls And uh, not only that, some schools even had separate entrances for the kids, like for boys and girls to enter the school by gender. And I was like, interesting, but yet they still have everyone in the same classroom together. But they make it such a a distinction for if you're playing, you can't play together. But then even in the classroom in this, they were doing boys against girls. They did boys against Mm -hmm. girls for the multiplication thing. They did boys against girls for the project. Mm -hmm. Yep. So... Yeah, I guess that was authentic. It was well-researched by American Girl. Gender constructs are a hell of a drug. Uh, Am I allowed to say that on this podcast? (laughs) (laughs) It's true, though. (laughs) Okay, I accidentally sent us on a really wild tangent there. But one thing I was thinking about, too, I don't know if anyone else here is a knitter, but, like, socks are so annoying to are hard. I 100% agree with Molly that that was a terrible that project was idea very bad for grade schooler I mean I I crochet I can't even knit because knitting's too hard like crochet is the easier option like when I tried knitting even like a scarf it was like a difficulty for me so I can't even imagine grade schoolers trying to knit a sock like well, the heel the hubris right <laughs> like I don't really knit but I'm sure I can knit socks which <laughs> yeah you have to do two of them and they have to match that's hard yes her uh ingenuity to save the knitting project when it clearly wasn't going to result in anything usable was admirable yes Mm. and she had incredible project management skills to like delegate tasks based on everyone's skills and abilities like that was impressive they assembly lined it and they got it done i will also give allison credit for very graciously Allowing Molly to step in and lead. Exactly. And letting her and be, be like, the star sure. of the photo at the end. <laughs> yeah. After she crashed 
their house they, they showed up like all sneaky like and they mm-hmm. you know sort of reluctantly came in and they showed up you know like wet late um mm-hmm. and yeah, without like any knitting three materials men in a trench coat show up. <laughs> yeah. I was like what is this she was like come in no problem we have extra materials and i'm like allison and allison's mom are far more gracious <laughs> I did well say. allison's mom was shady though because yeah. she yeah. was like i told allison for sure you would come you wouldn't be so rude as to not show up <laughs> So this is the third learns a lesson book that we've read so far. Do we need to have a school story every time? Like, what does that add to the experience of reading American Girl books? So my theory is that they do it because school is an instant uh, universal for kids, right? The vast majority of children in this country go to a school of some sort, And so I think that that's such a touchstone culturally that it's a it's an easy sort of setting to spotlight historical differences. And the back matter is literally always the same, pretty much, which I I find annoying because I'm like, we could have some really interesting historical context for some other things like. Uh, why are we at war, which they never once mentioned in any book. Mm. Uh, (laughs) But um, yeah, I do. I do think you're right. I think it's that touch point. And and interestingly, I think this is the first school story where school looks pretty similar to the way it is today. Yeah. Um, moving on, uh, if you guys don't have anything else to add, we have Molly's surprise. With Christmas shaping up to be a letdown this year, Molly and siblings managed to put aside their differences and work together to bring some magic back into the holiday the way their father always did. So this is the doll book. (laughs) The surprise books are always the girl gets the doll book, um, which is so interesting. It's the we've talked about how meta it is to have a book about a doll selling you a doll. And in that book, the doll herself gets a doll and then tries to sell you that doll as well. (laughs) So we have the, the sort of nesting dolls of the surprise books. This one. I thought this was pretty well written actually um i thought the conversations between molly and jill about christmas were pretty well rendered and true to how people process things Mm -hmm. i mean it was maybe a little bit more self-realization and i I don't know sort of self-help speak than a a 14 year old would normally do when she's telling molly like well this is what i was afraid of and doing this makes me feel like dad might be gone or you know, I wanted something different. So it wasn't reminding me of his absence. But I thought that that was pretty well done. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think generally, the Valerie Tripp books, my issue with them has been that they're very like, plot, 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 yeah. plot. And then denouement, and it's done. <laughs> There's not a whole lot of character building in them. But I think the Molly books did better than she did in mm. the Samantha books of actually developing the character through the books because Samantha had a very well-developed character, but it was in the books by Shaw Mm -hmm. that preceded the trip entries in it. But I think maybe trip connected better to Molly and her family, but I felt like there were much more fleshed out characters. And as far as tropes, they got a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. (laughs) So there's another one where it was just this instant sort of recognition of like, Oh, yeah, they're going to get this ad tree, but then that's beautiful because they make it happy. You know, <laughs> they did what they could. Um, yeah, I think yeah. I thought Molly was super relatable in this one. I mm-hmm. wrote down a quote from her early on being realistic means being boring and dull. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that per- perfectly encapsulates how a nine year old would feel about like war rations <laughs> and and losing the magic of Christmas. Um, I did feel like Molly wanting a doll was a little out of character for her. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. she seems like she would want uh, roller skates. Roller yeah. skates, a dog, skates. a bicycle. Yeah, something yeah. more active. I don't she doesn't seem like a doll kind of kid. Yeah. So yeah. and I, I think it's telling that she never really plays with a doll after <laughs> after this book. Like it's just not her. Um, but like you said, I really like Jill and Molly's relationship, especially in this book, because I like how most of the books, Jill's always trying to be the elder sister and she's feeling 
as we all did probably at that age, like now that she's 14 or a teenager, she's all grown up and she's above everything. Like I remember my cousin being, yeah, 14, 15, and she'd always want to sit with the adults at the adult table for our family reunions because she thought us kids were beneath her. And I was finally glad to see that Jill admitted that, hey, I'm scared too. I'm just putting on a front because I don't want you to be, you know, get scared or be disappointed. Yeah, I literally wrote in my notes as I was reading this, Jill sucks. And then like two pages later, oh, she bought the tree. That was pretty cool. (laughs) So I feel like she had a real turning point in this book (laughs) for me. (laughs) Yeah, I I wrote, I think I wrote, Jill's a little bit sanctimonious. I agree, Molly. But and I mean, you know, Molly has been a little bit of a of a brat in some ways. Maybe that's a stronger term than I want. But, you know, from from Molly's perspective, yeah, Jill's being a little sanctimonious. But then you see that sisterly uh, relationship kick in. And yes, like they're, you know, like Molly's nine, Jill's 14. Like that's, 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 that's a very different, um, a very different, those are very different places to be. Um, but yeah, I like, I like that despite, you know, the fact that Molly was driving Jill a little bit nuts <laughs> and vice versa, they still kind of came together in this. Yes, we are sisters and uh, we're both feeling similar things. I thought it, I thought that was really touching, actually. Um, I have a question. Why did Molly bite the Christmas tree? I didn't get that either. <laughs> I, was, I was, Yeah. So, OK, for, <laughs> for context, they go to buy the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. They get the saddest, frailest tree on the lot because that's what they can afford off of Jill's babysitting money that she had saved for a hat. And then Molly plucks needles off of the tree and chews them up. Who does that? Is that a, like a thing? Is like, she did testing it for like freshness? It could be. Maybe back then, like maybe they did add like kind of pine needles into recipes or like as a decorative like garnish or something. So maybe she was in the moment like we're getting a tree and she was excited. So she wanted to. <laughs> I don't know. Like how you smell it. Like how you love the smell of Christmas trees. Some people love the smell of Christmas trees. Maybe the, there's a taste. But I, I don't know because I've never I've never been. You've never to... eaten your Christmas tree. <laughs> I take it. Well, OK, even if that was a thing in the the 40s i don't think it was a thing in 1988 when valerie tripp wrote this book so she could have said like molly tasted the tree for freshness <laughs> as one did at that time like as she saw her mom do every year before or something <laughs> well, you could just take a needle Molly's and one snap of a long it. line of tree lickers <laughs> her dad wasn't there to do it so she carried on the legacy <laughs> Okay, but speaking about the decorations again, real briefly. Uh, so there was that whole conflict between like the homemade um, decorations mm. versus the more simplistic, fancy decorations like they'd had in Samantha. Um, you know, but Molly had like she wanted to pull out these, you know, nostalgic ornaments that I don't know they made or, you know, they put on the tree for her whole life. And Jill's like, I want a more simple aesthetic. Um, they, they had that same conflict here, which I thought was interesting. They did, except this one made a lot more sense because Jill was like, yeah, I just didn't want it to look the same as every year because it made me sadder that dad was missing. Mm-hmm. The Samantha one, it was just like, we're rich and we need to impress this girl that <laughs> is coming to visit. That's true. It was a more sympathetic. <laughs> this felt like a more earned Christmas debate. Right. Plus, it was like the whole patriotic thing. Like, well, oh, maybe we should was. support the war effort with our Christmas tree. Yeah, that that that, that, that kind of baffled me. It's like that Jill wanted patriotic tree, but let, she didn't want the old tree to remind her of dad. But I'm like, wouldn't the patriotic tree also remind you, be a constant right. reminder that your dad is overseas? I, I, I just want to say, like, the the patriotism, the the arbitrary patriotism, I know that this is very realistic to the times, but, like, all the little tidbits made me laugh out loud. Like, in this book, the, in the back matter, it said that, um, I guess, to preserve gas, you can only drive at a certain speed, but they called it the victory speed limit, and mm-hmm. the victory speed is 35 miles per hour, <laughs> which doesn't feel very victorious. <laughs> it feels like a very safe speed. <laughs> Next up, happy birthday, Molly. Molly is gearing up for her 10th birthday party when her family gets a surprising new addition, an English girl all the way from war-torn England named Emily. Emily is traumatized but eventually bonds with Molly playing princesses. They try to plan a joint party, but it only results in hurt feelings. A pair of birthday puppies mend the friendship. Okay, I don't remember if this is Linda or Susan, 
But early on, one of them says, a real English girl for your birthday. And that's a very strange thing to say. (laughs) That was Susan. And I know because I also thought that was odd and I wrote down, you know, really, Susan, as opposed to a (laughs) fake English girl. (laughs) Also, like you don't get a girl for your birthday. That's weird. (laughs) No, the the level of othering that happens to poor Emily in this book Uh, is so bad. But yeah. it's, I feel like it's also very, very true to how kids 100%. reacted to people who mm-hmm. had a different accent or were just different in general. Not because it was bad for kids, because kids are usually pretty open minded, but because it was so exciting to them. And they didn't they were kind of in, ignorant in a way. I was like really uncomfortable with Molly and her friends playing bomb shelter. Mm. Like that really stressed me out. And I was very relieved that like that was admonished later and like made very clear that like this is not a game (laughs) like Mm -hmm. people are actually in bomb shelters and actually losing their homes and like we're not gonna play like haha I'm losing everything I love and cherish like that's not a fun game because I was I was a little stressed at first that that was just gonna be like the fun game and that was that so I was glad that that was addressed probably not a game she wants to play right now and then Emily really called her out on it later too which Mm -hmm. I thought was good as well um because i also was worried that that was just gonna skate and yeah no mention of wow that's incredibly awful to do to somebody (laughs) yeah who who is presented in this book as having really significant like ptsd right and i i I also think there's even if they didn't have emily in their house it's still like not great to like be like having fun playing this imaginary game that someone's actually suffering through so Either way, I was glad that they um, addressed it. But I did think Emily's reaction was kind of interesting when they do have this like heart to heart, because Emily basically says like you like I you were not being empathetic to me and understanding my situation, but you also suffered because your dad is gone. And I don't think that those are I I don't think that those are equivalent. I mean, I thought that, uh, you know, I felt terrible for Emily when they were like, hey, you want to play bomb shelter? She was like, no. <laughs> but I mean, she was she was very quiet. And but when she did speak, I thought she was incredibly self-possessed. Like she called Ricky mm-hmm. or, or not called Ricky. Maybe she did. But she was like, hey, your airplanes are wrong. And she was like, no, this is not a game. You know, this is not what my life was like. Mm-hmm. I thought she was very clear about expressing things. She was very self-possessed for, you know, I mean, what is she like nine? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fun fact, we had Ella look into this um, evacuation thing as well. And um, it actually wasn't very common for children to be evacuated from London into America. Most children were evacuated into um, Canada. But there were a couple kids who had private, like non-official evacuations, which it seems like that's what the Molly Emily situation is. Because she's going to her aunt. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a friend aunt situation. So um, this might be still kind of realistic. Something interesting I noticed also, um, just like a side tidbit about American Girl birthdays. Um, So we always have a birthday book in the series. And I realized as I was reading that like, they always fall in the same, like, chunk of time. So that means like all American girls pretty much from this first set have to be born in the spring. <laughs> so I I looked into this. Uh all of the original 6 have spring birthdays and there are no American girls from the whole collection from what I could find who have birthdays in July or December, which um I think makes sense just because usually your changes book happens in the summer, so July is just kind of out and obviously December is always going to be your Christmas book. Mm. But I just felt bad for all the like uh, Sagittarius's and Capricorns <laughs> who did not get to have a, a doll that was close to their birthday. Mm. Um, I was annoyed at the, the back matter was about babies being born and not about like London children being evacuated or bombs or again, why is the war happening? Like none of those things present in the back matter. All right, moving on to Molly saves the day. Molly saves the day. Welcome to Camp Gowanigan, the perfect summer camp. Molly and friends are excited to hang out in nature and learn many new skills, but a new team competition splits the friends up. Molly learns to swim while leading her team to victory, but takes out half the campers with poison ivy. Okay, I'm just going to comment because Valerie Tripp also did the Samantha Saves the Day book, which had truly terrible names. 
She did it again in this book. And the like camp leader is a quote, roly poly woman named Miss Butternut. Oh, I missed that she was a roly poly woman. That's not great. <laughs> missed that too. What is going on here, Valerie Tripp? <laughs> okay, also, why is Miss Butternut not in the friends and family section, but Miss Guilford is, who's not even present on the island? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't notice that for that book. <laughs> really interesting. Doesn't make any sense. And like the uh, one girl who's like the camp, the team leader, she's not in the friends and family section. I feel like she should be there too. Mm, yeah. Dorinda? Dorinda. Dorinda. <laughs> yeah. Dorinda. Dorinda is a good like villain name and she was kind of a tyrant. You should be better with that naming. She's not in the friends and family section because she's not a friend. <laughs> she's not. She's Fair like enough. a frenemy. <laughs> Um, interestingly, this book was dedicated to Pleasant, and I was wondering why this of all books was the one that made her feel like thinking about Pleasant. Oh, weird. I don't know. Um, one thing I did find out was that they had been co-workers oh. uh, prior to Pleasant bringing her on mm. to write some of these books. Oh, interesting. So there was a pre-existing relationship there that wasn't the case with some of the other authors. So who knows? Maybe... Maybe they went to a camp together. <laughs> Maybe they had a summer experience together. And so that's why Maybe this book brought up fond memories. This, the whole camp kind of reminded me of um, like my experience in Girl Scout. Same. So <laughs> I don't, it, it's interesting because in the last book, she mentions Girl Scouts a couple times, but they never like do anything with it. Like they say she's in it, but she doesn't like go to a meeting or earn a badge. So I'm like, I was kind of annoyed. But like, I, I forgot about sit upons until yes. I was reading this and I was like, oh yeah, I definitely made a sit upon, which is like kind of a random object. Like <laughs> I don't know that I ever used my sit upon once I made it. Oh, I totally did because you could use them for other things. So my sit upon I hung on to and then like when I was in high school, well, okay, football games in Texas are a much bigger deal than they are here. Like it's an <laughs> event every week, high school football. And so you take your sit upon. And you would use it on the bleachers because the bleachers were just metal and cold and really uncomfortable. Mm. And then your butt wasn't cold. <laughs> and you're, you know, it was great. Sit upons were very functional. Why don't we just call them like cushions? <laughs> <laughs> because everything had funny names. Camp, right? <laughs> sit upons, <laughs> s'mores, like everything had funny names. <laughs> the other thing that made me think of Girl Scouts, though, was the, the taps lyrics. I didn't know that I was singing taps. <laughs> I like I know oh, that really? song. The day is I, done song. Yeah, I remember like God is not. I remember singing that, but I had I don't think we sang it to the taps tune. So I had no <laughs> idea that that's what I was singing. Oh, that's funny. We definitely did. The day is done, gone the sun. Da, yeah. Da, da. yeah. But I kind of like that about the camp book. In spite of its many flaws, it did capture camp in mm -hmm. a way that seemed very real to me. And like as I was going, I was kind of singing the little songs in my head because, yeah, it, it does track with how camps still get run. Yeah. But yeah, but <laughs> this camp was like the liability issues for this camp were bananas. Oh, I my mean, gosh. Molly almost drowned to death. She <laughs> almost drowned because and and then. They had said, well, the counselors will be hiding, so we'll know what's going on. But then they had no clue what was going on because when they got back, she was like, Molly, can you please explain how you were the one right. that ended up with the flag? You Clearly all they were on poison point the whole time. Oh, no. Clearly, they only meant that we would be watching from the mainland. We wouldn't have counselors on the island in case something goes wrong. No, because they were completely unaware of all of the things that went terribly wrong <laughs> i feel like this was a, a chance for the counselor to be like oh thank god yeah. <laughs> we're, yeah, gonna we're, break, we're watching we're gonna have some more chocolate <laughs> we're gonna take a nap just tell them to go play caps to the flag and we'll tell them we're paying attention <laughs> but, yeah there were just some weird things in this book though because again with the like escalation of stuff like <laughs> molly just goes too far time and again in these series like there's a huge difference between poor Linda, who is playing the game and blowing the whistle to alert people like, oh, no, they're here, which uh -huh. was her job in the game. That is very different 
than Molly collecting worms after Linda told her she had a phobia and of spiders worms and dumping them Ugh. all down her head and no. neck and shirt. That was mean. I would have trouble being friends with my friend after that. <laughs> Same. I'd be done. And then at the end, Linda was like, well, that's okay because we were playing the game. No, you were playing the game. <laughs> Molly was not. Molly was like... Well, okay. So I wanted to talk about that because I think given what you said about what we said in the intro about um, Valerie Tripp using all these books as a metaphor, I feel like this was the most obvious metaphor for war. War as hell. <laughs> That's what I put as yeah. my AKA for this where it's like Molly saves a day, AKA war as hell. Yeah. And she even says at one point, like, the gist of it is basically like you can't win in war because if you win, you lose yourself along the way because she did this like evil thing to her friend, but her friend theoretically did this evil thing back to her. But again, like one person was playing by the rules that they set out and like following mm -hmm. the guidelines and one person like went rogue and threw spiders yeah. at her. <laughs> one, Yeah. One person went way too far until, yes, maybe that's metaphoric for like Mm. the atomic bomb or something right but much like that the outcome seems to be like well that was a good move because you won right so <laughs> i'm not sure that there was really a clear like moral lesson from this other mm. than like yeah it's okay to just go as extreme as you need to if you win and there was a picture of them talking, you know, afterwards, mm -hmm. you know, when they've just realized, oh, no, we're about to have poison ivy. And Linda's like, oh, it's OK that you put <laughs> worms all over me. And I think Molly or someone is like placing their hand on someone's arm. And I'm like, no, you have poison ivy oil. Don't touch anyone. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah Molly. With, right. I'm just like, oh, no. Poor Linda doesn't deserve to get poison ivy, too, on top of the whole worm incident. <laughs> well, fun fact, poison ivy is an allergy. And I don't think I'm allergic to poison ivy, so oh, you are I would so have been lucky. Fine. lucky. <laughs> well, don't test it because yeah, it I'm also gets worse it. with repeated exposure. Yeah. <laughs> so I was not horribly allergic as a child. And at this point, like if I see it, I am covered. So I have to be so careful. Yeah. Well, okay. So then I just also wanted to note, I, I, just to give you us our back matter moment and our patriotism point i wanted an alliteration there but it didn't really work um it's also i learned from this back matter it is unpatriotic to take the train so in case we're all wondering anytime you've taken the train it's been unpatriotic patriots only walk <laughs> so that's what i learned what if they have to cross the ocean unpatriotic okay. <laughs> don't leave america what <laughs> Changes for Molly. The family is elated when they learn that Molly's father is finally coming home, and just in time, too. Molly is gearing up for her big tap dance as Miss Victory in the Red Cross show. But in order to make this night unforgettable, she has to have the perfect hairstyle, which is proving more difficult than she anticipated. Molly doesn't get to dance her solo, but she does get to welcome her father home. Final book, guys. <laughs> I think her raincoat is too big. <laughs> she looks kind of like the Morton Salt girl, though. Oh, with like yeah. the yellow the one and the, the boots. girl. It's kind of <laughs> cute. Yeah. The outfit. This one, not very much happens in this book, except like on the last page when dad shows up. <laughs> yeah. Like she does all of this planning about her solo, and we learn she's a phenomenal tap dancer, but then she doesn't even get to dance the solo. I didn't like the her mom was like, you can't wear the wet pen curls anymore because you're getting sick from them. She's a nurse. It's <sighs> like, that is not how you get sick. Wet yeah. hair doesn't make you sick. Why are we perpetuating this mess? Especially as someone who works in the medical field that she should absolutely know better. Yeah. And I mean, I think the, the tiny kernel of truth um, in that is maybe if like you go outside with wet hair a lot and you're doing lots of like no, like, you know, you're going from hot to cold, like, you know, maybe that temperature, I think the temperature fluctuation can maybe knock your immune system down a bit and make you more inclined to get sick. But that's not how it was presented. If you're sleeping in wet pin curls, like. Yeah, ear infection was a weird diagnosis anyway, because she had like a sore throat and like, wasn't she like stuffy or something? Like that's not an yeah, ear infection. Yeah, it seemed like she had just a general like upper respiratory thing. Mm -hmm. She and never then... even mentions ear pain. No. <laughs> she the, the ear infection seemed secondary to whatever like weird <laughs> upper respiratory virus she had. And if she had an ear infection and she was dancing, she probably would have noticed like a balance issue and they never, you know, go, oh, Molly 
Molly can't, you know, stand up straight during her turns. Related to that, every time she mentioned the the glasses, she took off the glasses and she couldn't see. I was like, I literally wrote down Chekhov's glasses because I just... (laughs) You thought she was going to fall down the stairs. (laughs) Obviously, it's like this, that's going to be a major plot point. Why would they mention it like four times? (laughs) I don't understand. It wasn't. Oh, see, and I think that's problematic too. Like a lot of what happens in this book is vaguely problematic because... The messages seem to be like glasses and straight hair are ugly. (laughs) So you can achieve your dreams by curling (laughs) your hair and getting rid of your glasses. (laughs) And like, yeah, there's never a point where they're like, Molly, why are you taking your glasses off? You look great. You need those to see. Yeah, I thought like the whole I thought the message the end was going to be her hair wouldn't curl. She tried like several times. Then she realizes like she can still be Miss Victory with her signature braids Mm -hmm. and her glasses on because that's who she is. No, curly hair was what got her the outfit. It was. (laughs) I mean, like Linda said, she she wasn't going to get to wear that crown with her normal hair. (laughs) Your brown sticks. It just wouldn't look right. (laughs) It is. It was Molly's glow up. And then she gets everything she wants. And then, oh, no, (laughs) viral (laughs) ear infection (laughs) takes her out. Yeah, I, I I will say one of the things I really liked about this book is I do think, again, this like Molly as a character development was really strong. And the relatability of her as just like a nine year old was really strong. So like, I loved the scene. Well, I loved when she mentions that her, her dad mentioned her in the same sentence as a pot roast. In the <laughs> <letter>. <laughs> Cause I noticed that too. And I was like, yeah, I'd be so mad if I was nine. And it was like, your sophisticated sister and your grown brother and you in a pot roast. <laughs> <laughs> and then later she's like having this real, that really sweet scene with her sister when her sister's curling her hair. And she says she noticed like Jill's socks are never wrinkled and she always has her hair in like a nice curl. And she's like, how did you learn to be sophisticated? Like I, I could never like keep my socks from getting wrinkled. How did you figure out how to do that? I thought that was really sweet and like super relatable to like when you're a kid at that age. Although I feel like I felt like that when I was 14 too. <laughs> like how I don't feel sophisticated yet. <laughs> yeah. Jill is very put together like she definitely presented more like a 16 or 17 year old in high school that's got her you know feet under her and she's got her head on her shoulders and she knows who she is now more than like freshman in high school yeah I guess she is a year older in this book so she was a freshman in the first book Although maybe it's because of the war, like she had to grow up a little faster because their dad's left. And uh, in, the other thing I was thinking about when we were talking about this whole like four year thing, I was started in 1944. Technically, I think it's been a year and a half since the series started. So we'd be like mid 1945. And didn't the war end in 19 mid 1945? I could have sworn, even though this is a winter book, I thought it was taking place in March. So we're already in the next year. So we're in 1946? Yeah. March, yep. Rainy, cold, March afternoon. So it's oh, March. Yeah, that's like two years later then. These sequences make so no sense. So the war would have been well over at that point then. That's... I don't understand the chronology of these Mm-mm. books. Yeah, that's problematic. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the I was very disappointed with the ending of the book. It was just so... Abrupt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dad's home. Yeah. And I was like rushing to, uh, to be very honest, I was rushing to finish it. And I was like, oh my God, that like she just got sick. There's so much left. And then I turned the page and, <laughs> and it's over. I have this very clear sense of reading the book and her dad comes home and like there's like this catharsis of, oh, nothing else matters now because she gets to see her dad again that like was very like poignant and emotional for me at that age and you know it it seemed like the whole tragedy of the hair and the role was just like totally swept away so I mean that was my you know one person's impression at the time and doesn't you know make all of those points about the story not valid but that's what I took away from it as at age nine or ten or whatever I was you know what I think would have helped for me? Her dad, when she comes back, says, Molly, you're exactly the same. <gasps> yeah. And I would think like, no, she's not. Yeah, she's it's been two years. She's uh, she has to have grown a lot, even just physically, but also like emotionally, mentally. We've seen her go through so much in these books. And I feel like that would feel like completing the arc for me if her dad was like, 
Molly, oh my gosh, you've grown so much or something so that it really felt like a journey happened. I agree. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Each episode, our intrepid researcher will enchant us with scintillating factoids related to our book. It's time to dive in and explore Ella's ephemera. Hi there, everyone. I'm Ella, and this is my ephemera, the part of the podcast where I tell you about some of the neat things I've learned while doing research. Molly was the first character and doll to be marketed with glasses. Her series is classified as 1944 on the covers, but the first book was set in 1943. Luckily for Molly, this was smack dab in the middle of the glasses revolution. Graham Poulin discusses their history and the work of J. Lewis in his work about design for disability when fashion meets discretion. Quote, in the 1930s, spectacles were classified as medical appliances, their wearers as patients. It was dictated that medical products should not be styled. In the 1930s, glasses were considered to cause social humiliation, but the health service maintained that their glasses should not be styled, but only adequate. But things began changing in the 1940s. While the decade started with leftover wire frames from the previous decade, World War II changed everything. Suddenly there were horn rims, solid plastic frames, cat eyes and combination glasses with plastic tops and metal bottoms. And in 1945, the first frames designed specifically for women began being manufactured. Molly really lucked out. Thanks for joining me on this deep dive. I'm Ella, and this was my ephemera. I think we covered a lot of ground in our discussion, so I just wanted to quickly touch on this kind of last question we've been thinking about with every American Girl book that we've read so far, which is, are there any new insights about American Girl that we've uncovered after reading this book? I don't know that there's new insights, just so much as the pattern in the formula is becoming more and more clear the more that we read them. So. I'm interested to see if we notice any differences as we move into different authors with the different girls in the series. Coming up, we'll get an expert's take on an important aspect of this novel that is not often discussed. But first, let's pay some bills. Learn a new language from home or on the go with Mango. Mango's award-winning courses bring you practical phrases from real-life situations in a way that makes you want to start the conversation. Every learner's experience is unique. Mango adjusts to your learning pace, teaching you until you feel confident with new words and phrases, creating a learning solution centered around you. Visit pgcmls.info and click on the online library tab to learn more. Climb into a real plane explore interactive exhibits and STEM activities, meet aviators at fly-ins, learn the history, and more at the world's oldest continuously operating airport. And it's right in your backyard. Come visit the College Park Aviation Museum, conveniently located walking distance from the College Park Metro. We are open Tuesday through Sunday. College Park Aviation Museum, the skies are for everyone. Now let's talk to someone who actually knows something about one of the main topics featured in the Molly books, aviation. So I'm Lauren Deutsch, the Assistant Education Manager here at the College Park Aviation Museum. Hi, Lauren. So you're an expert in aviation history, and we wanted to ask you some questions about one of the books in the Molly series. In Molly Takes Flight, her Aunt Eleanor joins the WASPs. Can you tell us a little bit about who the WASPs were? and why they were important? Yes, of course. So the WASPs were the women, the women Air Force Service pilots, and they were a bunch of women who the government got together. They were technically civilian pilots, and the government got them together to do the jobs that male pilots did before the war. So during World War II, obviously a lot of military male military pilots went abroad, uh, to fight in the war. And while they were gone, they needed pilots to basically like ferry aircraft from factories to air force bases, uh, train, um, other pilots. And so 
these two women, um, Jacqueline Cochran and Nancy Love, really fought for women to get those jobs. Um, and the government allowed it, at least for, I think the program lasted only a year and a half because, of course, uh, we entered the war quite late. However, um, it was the first time that women were um, doing military military pilot jobs. So in the book, Eleanor seems to have pretty unlimited access to planes like the PT-19, and she's able to take Molly flying. Was this an accurate depiction of women's access to flight during World War II? To be honest, when I read the book, I was actually quite surprised, too. I was like, where, where is she going? Where is this Air Force base? Uh, well, not Air Force base, but this airfield. And how does she own that plane? Is it her own private plane? Because a lot of women, um, if they were trained as pilots, well, a lot of um, pilot training programs would not accept women. And so there was actually this whole program set up through, again, the U.S. government um, to go to colleges and train um, civilians how to fly. And only 10 percent of those could be women. So that's how a lot of women got their um, experience. And if Otherwise, if you wanted experience, most people had to be wealthy enough to buy their own airplanes and then um, hire a pilot to teach them. So it was interesting hearing about how Eleanor was from a farm, and yet she had this access to this airplane. So I don't, in that kind of background, I would assume that perhaps... um, a good-natured person allowed them her uh, allowed her to fly their airplane, but um, I actually don't really think that's an accurate uh, depiction. I was surprised by that too. Generally, when women joined the WASPs, did they have to have prior flight experience? They did, and that was actually um, an interesting contrast from the male pilots. So. A male pilot at the time, um, well, they didn't have to be a pilot. Uh, They had to be between 18 and 26 years old and have a high school diploma. And actually that was lower down from um, a college degree because they were really strapped for people. However, with their women, they were very um, diligent in getting women that already had a pilot's license. Um, There was about 25,000 women who applied for this program, and only less than 2,000 were accepted. Um, And even after they were accepted, they still had to go through a six-month-long intensive training course. Um, So they were already highly qualified um, and then had to be trained even more. What were their options like after the war and the program ended? The program actually ended because, again, World War II was wrapping up and male pilots, um, you know, had this newfound hope that because, you know, they had made it, um, they were looking back at home and trying to see what options were available to them when they came home. And when they saw that these women pilots were taking over their jobs, they got very upset. And um, a lot of congressmen uh, tried to shut down the program because, They thought that it would take away um, jobs from these returning veterans. What they didn't seem to realize was that these women were also veterans. um, And again, that they had extensive training and were highly qualified. But they did. They um, shut down the program. And there's even a class still training while when they heard the news. And they were the so-called like lost class because they never got a chance to actually um, perform their jobs. A lot of women just went back home to their normal, um, quote unquote, normal lives. The women who did try to stay in aviation had to go and become like um, air stewards or um, work in air traffic control because there were no real pilot options for women, either in the military or commercial. Molly loved her first flight, but would she have even been able to follow in Eleanor's footsteps in aviation as a young adult woman in the 50s and 60s? The sad thing about looking at this through like an adult's eyes, like this really inspirational book for um, young girls is knowing the history. And so knowing that, yeah, opportunities became much slimmer. The 1910s to like the late 1920s and going into the 30s was like the golden age of aviation for everyone, but in particular women, because 
when flight was still getting off, it still it wasn't as gendered as it became later. And um, there were more opportunities. However, discrimination actually seemed to get stricter over time. And it wasn't going to be until the 70s until um, there was the first uh, female pilot of a commercial airline. You shared with me that you had a Molly doll and read the books as a child. What drew you to her and how did it feel revisiting her now as an adult? I think what initially drew me to Molly was just how similar we looked. Um, I wear glasses as does she and we both have, you know, brown hair, which is common enough. But out of the array of American Girl dolls, I definitely picked her because I, I was drawn to her as a character versus the time period she was from. And I think that's a really great thing about American Girl dolls is that they do get you through the personality and then draw you into the history. Because obviously this was like a very bleak time in America's history. But um, I really liked her like carefree spirit as well as, you know, like she had a little dog and she she seemed to have the same energy as that dog, like really energetic and optimistic um, despite what was going on around her. And as you can see in the book, um, And like I said, so I think revisiting it as a doll, it was very hearing, reading the story was inspiring, but also, again, knowing the history, it filled me a little bit with dread because I know that we have this idea in history that everything is always progress and everything always gets better over time. And of course, er things got a lot better after World War II, but opportunities for women pilots in particular did not. Would a little girl who had read the Molly books and was inspired by them when they came out in the 80s have had a path forward in aviation at that time? Yeah, I do think so. I think there's still a huge indiscrepancy in the field today, in the aviation field of um, male to female pilots, Um, not even male to female pilots, but in aviation all the way across. Um, And there's a lot of there's a lot of attention given to try and recruit women into like, you know, the sciences, obviously, and aviation in particular. But that was like, obviously, like 70s, 80s, 90s. This is when women were fighting to become pilots of commercial airlines. Um, things where women's pilot uniforms were being um, very much critiqued and changed to make them more utilitarian instead of... Um, quote-unquote fashionable. A lot of these things were just trying to make it more normal. And I think this was a good way to inspire yeah, women or little girls to get into the field and then just to make that a normal process so that it wouldn't have to be a dream. It could just be a fact of life. Lauren, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us on the pod today and talking to us a little bit about Molly and the history of women in aviation. Uh, Now we'll be moving on to our game segment. If Ricky really wanted to insult Molly, he'd probably call her a turnip. But it made us wonder, what kind of vegetable would Molly actually be? We'll figure that out now with the help of a handy BuzzFeed quiz by Audrey Engvelsen. Okay, so quiz. First off, if you were a vegetable, which dish would you want to be? Oh, and we're doing this from Molly's perspective. So we're doing this as answering as if we were Molly. So what you guys think she would pick. So we're going to discuss this as a group. So the options are soup, salad, casserole, sandwich, ratatouille, pizza. I feel like because she's a kid, it would be pizza. But I don't. Yeah, they had pizza back then, right? She's in like suburban or maybe rural Illinois. So I'm think guessing casserole. she wouldn't have had a ton of exposure to pizza during mm. this time period. Yeah, I think I would lean towards like casserole or, or sandwich, sandwich, maybe. Yeah. I mean, casserole does have a kind of foreign sounding ring to it. <laughs> so maybe if she was feeling really patriotic, she would want to go with like a victory sandwich. I guess I was thinking like casserole feels very 1940s, like suburban. It's very Midwestern too. Yeah. Mm. Would so. that be a favorite for kids back then too, though? Because I know casseroles are a lot of times often for nowadays, they're kind of like, ew, casseroles for like children. So I don't know if that would. Okay. Yeah. Maybe she's a victory sandwich. <laughs> okay. So sandwich. <laughs> All right, sandwich. Okay. Next question. Which aisle in the grocery store do you sh- would Molly shop in the most? The options are snacks, cheese and dairy, 
produce, bakery, frozen foods, and health. I think bakery. <laughs> bakery. Oh, yeah. Because she's, she's really missing the butter and sugar, and she loves the bread. Mm-hmm. She loves the bread. Oh, yeah. Sweets. So definitely, definitely bakery. bakery. Bread day. Remember that whole bread day <laughs> plot line? <laughs> Okay, now we would choose a fruit for Molly. There's strawberry, banana, apple, pineapple, mango, and cherry. She eats apples, but I feel like she would go with pineapple maybe because of the hula costume. Oh, yeah. She would like attach that to Hawaii and be like, look, it's part of my costume. It's a pineapple. (laughs) All right, finally, choose a word to describe Molly that could also be used to describe a vegetable. (laughs) The words are fresh, ripe, tender, juicy, organic, and rotten. She's fresh, right? Fresh. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Oh, and here it is. She is fiddlehead. Oh. (laughs) I've never heard of that vegetable. Not going to lie, you're a bit of a wild card. While some people have a hard time nailing down what exactly you are, they know for sure that you're unconventional, weird, and awesome. There's nobody quite like you, and you embrace that. I think that's more or less okay. <laughs> it's not It's not wrong for Molly. <laughs> no, the last book undercuts it a little bit because she does like the opposite of who she is to get the solo, and it rewards that. But, wild card behavior. But yes, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but the rest of the books, I think, are very in keeping with that. <laughs> All right. So now it's time for our Bechdel test. Each episode, we ask whether our book passes the Bechdel test, which asks whether a work features two female characters who talk to each other about something that doesn't involve men or boys. So does Molly pass the Bechdel test? Yes. It's Absolutely. always with her friends talking to her two female friends. They even when they bring up love interests when they watch Jill and her friend, they they're at that stage where they're still like, "Ew!" Like, yeah. I mean, they talk a lot about her dad in the books. They talk a lot about Ricky and getting back at him or him being annoying. But there's plenty of interactions that don't hinge on that you know there's molly's aspiration for the solo there's the project they're all working on the whole class. color war i mean the whole yeah molly saves the day i don't think there's one all of the man in the book <laughs> yeah. yeah well that's it for this episode of these books made me join us next time when we'll discuss a book about a girl who witnessed a disturbing incident involving chocolate cake if you think you know which book we're tackling next drop us a tweet we are at PGCMLS on Twitter and hashtag These Books Made Me. You can also send us your questions at These Books Made Me at PGCMLS.info. For historical deep dives and read alikes, check out our blog, which is linked in the episode notes. Special thanks to our guest Lauren from the College Park Aviation Museum, our fabulous researcher Ella, amazing interns Mariama and Jalan, and our producer extraordinaire Will.